Yes, let us begin. All right, I think you're up first. I am up first. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to um, another episode of uh, um, uh, Kayak's online Kayak seminars brought to you by uh, uh, the, uh, the national staff. Um, tonight's episode uh, is featuring Scott Sispaniak. C- and I have to be careful about that because with a name like Bonifacio Robinal to Gooding Jr., I want to make sure I say it correctly. Scott Sispaniak is on tonight, and he will be discussing kayak navigation in the context of Oxpad. Um, this this session is currently being recorded, so right now you're um, being recorded. Um, if you don't mind turning off your cameras to save bandwidth, that is fine. Uh, muting yourself. Uh, if you um, have any questions or comments, feel free to uh, enter that into the chat and I will monitor, monitor the chat room. Um, I think those are all the housekeeping um, uh, discussion points. Before we begin and I hand over the, the, the podium to Scott, let me uh, give you a little bit of uh, Scott's bio, if I may. Uh, Scott Sispaniak, started his navigation journey as a scuba instructor teaching underwater navigation in the early 1980s. He joined the Coast Guard in 1984 and qualified as a 41-foot utility boat coxswain on Cape Cod a year later. He was issued his first Coast Guard 100 gross ton master's license in 1987. After his enlistment expired, the Coast Guard called him back to be a civilian employee, leading the Coast Guard Licensing Office in the Regional Exam Center from 1990 to 1998. In this capacity, he worked with commercial mariners and mariner training professionals. Scott missed running boats, so he started working part-time in 1991, running ferry boats and education vessels on Boston Harbor. 1991 was the year that Scott discovered sea kayaking. He soon was leading groups and was certified as an American Canoe Association open water coastal kayak instructor. In 2002, Scott moved from New England to Charleston, South Carolina, where he continued with his passion for sea kayaking, teaching sea kayaking, and leading groups of sea kayakers. In 2008, he founded and opened Sea Kayak Carolina, a full service enthusiast sea kayak shop providing retail sales, guided tours, and instructions. He was certified as an ACA open water coastal kayak trainer and has trained and certified sea kayak instructors from all over the world. After working in the commercial diving, marine salvage, and passenger vessel industries, Scott after a short 22-year break, is back with the Coast Guard that he loves. As a full-time Coast Guard civilian employee, Scott is the Recreational Boating Program Specialist for the Southeast United States, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Scott was recently certified as an on-water powerboat instructor by the National Safe Boating Council. Scott is very excited to provide this basic navigation seminar with us tonight. And that, and with that said, let's welcome Scott. Scott, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Joey. That was quite a nice introduction you gave me. I'm blushing here. Um, I'm real excited to uh, give you this presentation uh, tonight. And I, I call it the basics of kayak navigation. It, it's at uh, an Oxpad focused audience and uh, a lot of lot of things going into navigation and in kayak navigation uh, until I remembered that the ACA had a navigation uh, uh, curriculum or not uh, lesson plan at level one, two, and some level three uh, and four and five. But uh, I said, well, that that's going to help me focus what my presentation's on tonight. So. Um, ACA level one and two level kayak navigation with a little extra L3 thrown in. Um, please be interactive with the chat. I think Joey's going to monitor it. Uh, I think we'll have a, a more fun and productive time. 
uh, requests that you do hold questions till the end. If you do have a burning question, raise your hand and, and uh, Joey can break in here and, and uh, let you in. Tonight's presentation is aimed at students new to navigation. Uh, and if you do have some navigation experience, um, uh, perhaps uh, you can use the presentation uh, with thoughts as being an instructor. And having said that, if we have time after our general question and answers, we'll do a little instructor chat. So uh, if you don't mind now, if you could just type in real quick, if you have any uh, any navigation experience uh, to, to the whole group, to everyone, and if you're a navigation instructor, and we can start to get a feel for uh, uh, who, who, who's in the audience. Come on now, don't be shy. And Courtney's a boat crew, not just the boat crew. That's a, a key, key spot. Anybody else? Jason runs on his boat and he uses his handheld GPS. Uh, Warren instructs now for boat crew candidates. Good. This is the kind of stuff I'm looking for. Um, Lori's a scuba instructor. Uh, uh, that's a great thing to do. Uh, river kayaking instructor, coxswain trainee. Great. Well, just, uh, just the kind of audience I was hoping for. <clears throat> So the objectives tonight, um, uh, first objective is to stay alive with some rules of the road basics. We're gonna talk about uh, chart features, measure distances, uh, the difference between true and magnetic north, uh, deducing where we are with dead reckoning. We're gonna go with the flow and use the tides and the currents to help rather than uh, hinder. Uh, we're going to try to get back using reciprocal courses. We're going to stay alive by determining risk of collision. We're going to stay alive and help our rescuers if uh, if we need rescuers by filing simple folk plans. And uh, we'll augment paper charts, traditional uh, basic chart navigation with some, some modern strategies. All right. And then, uh, like I said, hopefully we'll have some question and answers. So big and ugly rule. I don't know if it's written in the Colreg's rule book, but um, uh, for kayakers, uh, it's, it's the only really uh, critical rule of uh, the road is if the other vessel is bigger or uglier than you are, and, and our kayaks are pretty small and they're pretty pretty, uh, then uh, you, the kayaker, is going to stay out of the way. And the uh, ACA objectives specifically um, uh, talk about paddling defensively. And what that means is you, you, you've got to make sure you don't get run over. We, uh, we like to wear bright colors, but I always caution uh, that that might lull you into a false sense of security. Uh, I often pretend I'm invisible in a busy harbor environment uh, and that the other, the power boaters and the sail boaters and the others are, uh, are are not looking for me, whether or not I'm wearing bright colors or not. So don't get lulled into a false sense of security. We wanna paddle outside of channels if we can. And if we're crossing channels, uh, we'll group up outside the channel, look both ways, cross quickly at right angles, and we'll keep uh, in a school to uh, uh, not be strung out in a single file crossing the channel. If we are paddling at night or during reduced times of reduced visibility, um, we'll have a flashlight uh, to be illuminated in sufficient time to prevent a collision. Alternatively, an all around white light might do the trick for us, uh, but uh, very often that that light on a pole, as you're seeing pictured there, um, is uh, um, uh, a potential impediment to stability. It's just a little extra stuff up in the air that might make the uh, the kayak a little tippier, and probably more realistically, it's it's often hard not to 
to to whack that uh, uh, light um, uh, mast with a with a paddle. So uh, I, I always like the uh, white light on the deck. Um, so Joey, I'm just going to check in with you. I'm um, I'm I don't want to be talking into a in an empty microphone all night. Uh, so far, so good. So far, so good. I hear you loud and clear, and there are no questions or comments in the meeting chat at this time. Okay, great. Thanks. So we'll um, we'll be talking a little bit about um, uh, NOAA nautical charts. This is a, an inset of the area that I paddled yesterday on the Folly River, just uh, just south of Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, we'll talk about a little bit about some general chart features. Um, so I, I just put a square on some brown stuff on the screen. Uh, anybody want to want to talk about what that brown stuff might be representing on the on the chart? Land. All right, land. So land above normal uh, high tide, and so. Okay, there's our first uh, exercise. Uh, do we have another star up here? Here, what's the um, well? Water. Water there, and any any characteristics of that particular the spot depth of water? The depth. Yeah, it's some shallower water. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, and that star up in the upper uh, right hand corner. Deeper water. Deeper water. Yeah, more deeper water. So good. This, um, I, I don't know if I think we popped over it. This area, if you see the words Hingham Harbor, um, that uh, it's not brown, it's not blue, it's sort of greenish in there. Um, uh, any any ideas about what that, what that greenish water is or up here on the cove by the Weir River? So yeah, mangroves harsh, up there. Right? Marsh. Yeah, marsh. So, so, and and on the beach here as well. So that represents um, uh, an area that would be uh, uncovered and and squishy, but but dry at low tide and covered up at at high tide. Okay. Okay. So we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, depth on a chart, and this is a. Uh, uh, this is an excerpt in Charleston Harbor. You've got Coast Guard Base Charleston annotated on there on the Charleston Peninsula. <clears throat> um, but in the in the chat room, um, but just uh, what what's the depth in the center of that that uh, circle, or or just shout it out. One foot. One, one foot. Okay, good. So one foot. What's the depth there? Eight feet. Eight foot. Eight. Yeah. Good. 16, 27, yeah, 27. 27. Yeah. So uh, let's see. What are what are the units of measure that you're normally going to see on a chart? Feet or fathoms. fathoms. Yeah. So feet, fathoms, sometimes meters, but on, on the charts that we would be normally using for um, uh, kayak navigation, more often than not at, at feet. Um, uh, state of the tide, what, what would the state of the tide be uh, if, at that one foot or eight foot or 27 foot mark? Mean, lower, low. Right. Yeah, and mean, lower, low water. So um, I'm not a mathematician. A mathematician would say uh, average and mean is not the same thing. But for the purposes of kayak navigation, I guess it is um, on the average lower low water here in Charleston. There's a six foot tidal range um, on the average low water. That one foot spot, it's going to be one foot of water at that depth. Will it ever be less than one foot of water at that depth? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK, so uh, if if there is a. A spring tide, which happens around the time of new moon and full moon every month, not just in the springtime. That springtime is related to new moon and full moon. Uh, it might be a minus uh, 0.5 tide there 
And so there'd be six inches of water at that one foot spot. Or if today uh, there was a, a strong uh, northwest wind here in Charleston, that might be uh, probably was zero at that point. I walked down to the harbor earlier and the tide was super far out because uh, the, the wind was just simply blowing the water out of the harbor. So let's see, we've got some other chart features right around that uh, one, one foot spot. What do you see there in the center just next to the one? Square. square. Yeah, a square. And that's representative of a of a mark, a fixed state to navigation. And the um, picture to the right is the actual photograph of that square in Charleston Harbor. And and why might there be a, a danger mark at, at, at that point right there? Because you're, 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 you're in a boat and you're on the ground. Looks like <laughs> underground wires. Well, um, underground wires and 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 particularly there's deep water almost up to the peninsula all around the harbor, but in that particular area it's a shallow Hello. area, so we're we're warning boaters away uh, with with that day mark. Is that a good is that a good place to kayak right there? Sure. Yes. Yeah, it's a great place to kayak because uh, you're. Your uh, uh, power boats and sailboats, and probably even the jet skis, know better to be in that that close. But uh, we might draw four inches or or six inches at most, and so good good strategy to be paddling in the shallow shallower water where where deeper vessels can't go. Okay. So we have uh, another. Um, chart excerpt here, and we have what's that there in the center of the circle? Buoy, buoy, buoy. Lighted, lighted buoy, lighted, lighted buoy, and so, um, and uh, what what do you see in between the twenty five and the twenty four? Four. So or the, the, uh, the number four identifying what the buoy number is. Right, as as Arlo Guthrie would say, uh, quotated. Um, and so that quotation next to the aid to navigation uh, is if you were to paddle up to it, for example, and look at it, that's what you'd see on it. And again, that that particular buoy that I did, I took all these pictures today. I've been, I'm getting pretty tired here. So, but, uh, <laughs> No, that, that is the actual uh, uh, representation on the chart of number four and a, and a photograph of that, that exact number four. All right, what, uh, what color is this one? Yellow. Yellow. Yeah. Yellow, and so uh, yellow, the, the Lima anchorage buoy, um, uh, for extra credit beyond the objectives, does anyone know why the uh, Anchorage buoys are painted yellow? Not, not to confuse with the red and green markers. Mm, that was a good guess. Anybody else? Yeah, so in the old days of sailing ships, uh, when you came into port, into the port of Charleston with your load of uh, sugar cane or, or whatever you might have come into, uh, that you picked up in in the tropical islands, you had to anchor up at the anchorage buoy uh, for your quarantine inspection to make sure there were no yellow fever or other uh, other uh, you know, such diseases. So that's that's the tradition of how the anchorage buoys are yellow. I'm, I'm waiting for somebody in the chat to say he's just making this stuff up. <laughs> okay. So we've got some um, fixed dates and navigation. These are courtesy, these photographs and chart excerpts uh, photographs are courtesy of our friend Paula Hubbard, who does a pretty uh, in depth level four, level five navigation session. Uh, and so you, these fixed aids 
uh, are represented uh, on the chart by perhaps the green square uh, down at the bottom, green number nine, not representing number three there, uh, uh, or in uh, an uh, orange, orange square. All right, so a lot of different symbols and um, the, the uh, a great way to figure out any symbols that you might have a question on a chart. You can send me an email and say, I'm going to stump you on this one, Scott, or you could download U.S. chart number one. And uh, that has the list, uh, I think it's 40 or 50 pages long. Uh, I had an introvert friend who went on a a cruise with her mother and she she took her chart number one to, to read on the way because she didn't <laughs> like hanging out at the bar yeah. so all right so we'll um uh what are we going to do now i think we're going to talk about measuring distances on a nautical chart um uh, perhaps we have a video here the dividers are first adjusted to a width of one nautical mile as measured from the chart's vertical latitude scale next to the charted track. One nautical mile is equal to one minute of latitude. The dividers are then walked down the length of the charted track. A total of six miles are walked off. At the end, a partial mile is present. The dividers are readjusted to measure this partial mile. The dividers are then placed over the latitude minute scale to read the partial mile measurement. In this example, the chart has minutes divided into tenths, and three tenths of a mile are added to the six nautical miles previously measured. All right, so a couple things with that. Um, anybody ever try to keep a pair of dividers in a dry bag in a kayak? Yeah, poke poke holes right in it. So what, what are some alternate methods of, of using the, the latitude scale or, or the, the chart scale at the bottom in the, in the kayak navigation world? You can use a string. All right, you can use a string. So you you measure your course off from the starting point to the ending point on a string and hold that up against the scale and measure distance that way. That's one great way. What's a what's another way to do it in the kayak environment? You could use a protractor with a mileage scale on it that has to fit the, uh, for the chart that you're using. So if it's a, you know, if there may be a one to 40,000 or one to 80,000 scale on the protractor and you could read the miles off of that. Yeah, that's a great strategy. And now you've got a device to, um, to transfer a line to measure a course. We'll get to that in a little more. I often use a piece of marsh grass to dry it up piece of marsh grass and I just break it to the length of the um, uh, course line on the chart and then then compare that to the scale uh, or sometimes I'll use my fingers. Uh, the other other thing about that is I think we we came out with 6.3 nautical miles on the example that we used. I, I can't do math at 6.3 uh, but I can do math at 6 uh, so we we can estimate. Uh, again, we're not we're not surveyors. We're not setting uh, buoys. We're we're just getting rough distances, uh, and then uh, hopefully to see how long it's going to take us to get there. So, um, how how fast do we generally paddle? Anybody? And depending on current, three miles an hour, three knots. Three knots, three miles an hour. Um, I I think that that might be sometimes a little ambitious, um, but if we're going three knots or three miles an hour, and uh, and I know you uh, navigation uh, purists are are uh, it's like chalk on the 
blackboard that I'm saying three knots and three miles an hour is about the same thing. It is about the same thing, especially uh, for the purposes of, of kayaking. At, at three, three miles an hour, how do we, far do we go in an hour? Three miles. Three miles. Three miles. Three 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 miles. Yeah. So at, at uh, two knots, how far do we go in an hour? Two miles. Yeah. So, so again, a, a, a larger group, uh, less experienced paddlers, we might figure in no current and no wind, we, we might figure two knots, uh, a smaller group, um, maybe more, more experienced paddlers and longer, longer, uh, uh, narrow quiets, maybe figure out three, three, knot, uh, three knots as a, as a speed. Um, so let's, let's go with that smaller, uh, or that larger, perhaps slower group, uh, at two knots, how long does it take to paddle four miles? Two hours. Two hours. That, that simple. And, uh, uh, a lot of you folks, um, uh, indicated that you've got some experience. Um, we got to remember to keep it simple at the, uh, um, uh, level one and level two. Um, uh, environment and and student, we're building a foundation that we want them to have a good, strong, solid foundation before we get more more complicated. So, all right. So, so um, uh, deduced reckoning, dead reckoning. Um, uh, our our friend Paula Hubbard provided this graphic here. Uh, she drew a um, she drew a course across the bay there, and she measured it out and she marked it out at one mile intervals. And you can see down at the bottom on the scale, zero to one. That's about the same distance as her as her uh, nubs there. Um, so if uh, if we're paddling, oh, sorry about that. If we're paddling at um, at three knots, how long do we expect, uh, where do we expect to be uh, at, at the end of an hour? Three miles from our starting point. Right, and represented on the chart by what? The dot, the third, yeah, the third red tab, the third red, yeah. And so, how how long is it going to take to to uh, to make that crossing at three knots? An hour, an hour and fifteen minutes. No, hour and twenty minutes. Yeah, about an hour and twenty minutes, an hour and a half, because we're never we're we're rarely paddling straight along in a steady three knots, where we might stop and look at the dolphins or or have a snack or that sort of thing on the water. Uh, but uh, again, we, we've got some idea where we're going to be at a certain, at a certain point in time. Uh, here we'll be uh, at three knots. We expect to be there in about 20 minutes, uh, about there in about 40 minutes, about there in an hour, about there an hour and 20 minutes. So about an hour and a half if, if we're doing a nice steady three knots across the harbor. Does anybody have any questions about that? No. And right, I'm gonna move along hearing no questions. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about true north versus, versus magnetic north. If we're paddling a kayak with a compass, uh, inevitably it'll be a, a magnetic compass, something like the one on the left there. And that's actually a pretty accurate compass. There, there's other, uh, compasses, magnetic compasses, specifically designed to uh, to work on a kayak, and we can work on the outer rows here, which represents two north. Then we've got a comp, we've got a, 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 a we've got to figure it out how what's what's the difference between two true north and magnetic north. The easiest way to do it is simply plot our course on the magnetic chart using the inner magnetic ring and correlate that to the magnetic compass. Uh, for the purposes of what we're doing in a kayak, 
uh, under under most normal circumstances, uh, it's it's more than ad, uh, adequate. If uh, if you're an experienced paddler with a magnetic compass and there's less than a foot of waves, how how far do you how close do you think you can hold that that kayak on course if you're supposed to be uh, uh, paddling three zero zero degrees here? You could easily go a degree, a couple degrees off in either direction. It's you, you're not going to hold the course to one degree in a kayak. Yeah, and I I would submit it's more like uh, uh, ten degrees in either direction, or or even thirty degrees in either direction if if you have that one foot chop. So uh, so so again, we're we're um, we're more like uh, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, sea creatures than we are uh, NOAA research ships. Uh, we we want to head uh, head across the harbor at um, on on a northwest course. Uh, but we're swinging between zero and two seven zero. We'll uh, we'll find our way across across the harbor. Can I ask a question about that on GPS chart or on GPS whether they're handheld or or fixed mount in a boat. Do the most of the modern GPS units do magnetic north, or most of them do true north? I am um, I I use a lot of Garmin high end products over the last five or ten years, and almost every device I've got, um, every every uh, app, um, uh, every chart plotter, you have the you have the luxury of of programming it to to true or magnetic. What do people prefer to navigate with? I think most people don't navigate with true or magnetic. They use the the chart plotter as a um, a heads up display, like they're uh, like they're driving down the highway, and so they're they're uh, it it doesn't matter because they're just looking at the the line that's extended out in front. Uh, of their their vessel in the center of display and just pointing that kind of where they want to go. Um, for the purposes of kayak navigation, if we are using a chart, we're definitely using a magnetic compass. So let's just stick with the inner magnetic read uh, ring and and navigate that way. If you're a, if you're a, a maritime academy cadet uh, learning to navigate ships, that have a big gyroscopic compass on board the ship, you're, you're navigating with um, uh, true north and then you're uncorrecting it. So you give the course to the helmsman in magnetic because he's looking at a, a steering compass that's a magnetic compass. All right. Yeah. <laughs> to determine the direction of a planned course, first draw the course on a chart. Place the parallel ruler next to the line and walk the ruler to the nearest compass rows. With the edge of the ruler going through the center of the compass rows, the course direction may be read in degrees true north using the outer circle or degrees magnetic using the inner circle. The difference between the two is called magnetic variation. In this example, the course heading is 320 degrees true as read from the outer circle or 301 degrees magnetic as read from the inner circle. All right. So, uh, using that example there, uh, if we're not if we're not working with parallel rulers or a a, a parallel rule um, or a sliding ruler, what what are some other ways to to transfer the course from from where you want to go, point A to point B, 
to transfer that line over to that uh, inner uh, inner circle on the compass rose. Anybody have any strategies for that? All right, you you might just slide a slide a, a ruler or a straight edge over there, uh, and and look for a, a reasonable um, uh, parallel line to get a close enough kind of close enough kind of course. Let's talk a minute about reciprocal courses. Uh, reciprocal course, we plot a course out, uh, and we want to get the opposite course to come back in. So if you're you're making a crossing and 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 it uh, gets foggy and it's time to turn around and head back to the landing, uh, you'll take your your first course. Uh, perhaps it was zero nine zero. You'll add one hundred and eighty degrees to it, and you'll come up with your reciprocal of two seven zero. If it's uh, your course is two seven zero and you add one hundred and eighty degrees to that. Now you've got a number bigger than 360, uh, subtract 360 and you'll come up with your 90 degrees. Or you can simply draw a line through the compass rows on the chart uh, to see in this case that the, the reciprocal course of, of uh, 0, 060 degrees out is 240 degrees back. All right. So I like to uh, do some trip planning using uh, Google Earth Pro. It's free to download on your um, uh, desktop or your or your laptop or your tablet or your phone, uh, and it's got a good uh, it's got a good strategies to uh, to do some trip planning. You get to see some things that you don't see on your um, uh, nautical chart. I like to use it in. Uh, conjunction with a with an article chart, and you can see here this is the the class that uh, the trip we took yesterday that we started at the Folly boat landing up to the um, uh, upper right of the screen, and we paddled down the river. We made a crossing, uh, paddled on the opposite bank to avoid the marina, and then we uh, paddled back over the river to the sand. And that tells me it's about 1.88 nautical miles. I'll just call that uh, two nautical miles for the purposes of kayak navigation. And uh, figure if we're going about two knots, it's going to take a, about an hour uh, to make that trip. Um, I'm going to not do a quick demo, but I highly encourage um, you, you to check out Google Earth Pro uh, as, a, as an augment to the, um, uh, and, and in conjunction with uh, the traditional paper charts. There's some other uh, apps that uh, uh, unfortunately don't show up on the uh, desktop, so I can't do a demonstration tonight, but I like Navionics Boating. I've used that for a number of years, and you can drop a pin with your finger on the screen uh, and draw a straight line and get a, a good good idea. And so there's an as the crow flies line for the same distance, and it uh, comes out as as 1.8 nautical miles, a little little less than our other because it was a, a straight line navigation. But the added advantage of a program like this is if your smartphone's equipped with GPS, uh, you'll get a dot where your your boat, where your kayak um, it actually is. So another another handy tool. What's going on here? Tide changes. Where the water go? The folks from the, the inland lakes uh, have a hard time dealing with the tide coming in and coming out. Um, it's the water level rising and falling due to the, the gravitational attraction to the moon and, and the sun and some other um, um, heavenly bodies. Why is it important for kayakers? Because you need water. water. Yeah, right. You need water, yeah. and it also you can uh, estimate what the currents are going to be doing. Right. Well, uh, we'll we'll jump into the tidal currents in the next slide, uh, but but that definitely plays into it. And is there water there? So can we 
we paddle across that estuary at high tide, but we'll be stuck in the mud uh, at low tide, or we'll we'll never make it. Um, uh, what's the what's the tidal range in in your area? About three feet. Where's where's that, Jason? Uh, on the Potomac in D.C. All right. Anybody up in New England? Anybody in the Gulf of Mexico? Yes. Well, except that I use the inland rivers. Uh, a couple yeah. of feet. About a foot. Okay, great. So um, uh, in the that first picture was the Bay of Fundy, about 30 foot tidal range. I paddled a lot in Boston Harbor over the years, about a, a 12 foot tidal range. Uh, here in Charleston, about a six foot tidal range. The Florida Keys and the Gulf of Mexico, about a one foot tidal range. Um, and the, the East Coast is primarily a semi-diurnal uh, tide, which means there's two highs and two lows in a 24-hour period. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, the Florida Keys, it's one high and one low, or a diurnal tide in a 24-hour period. Uh, again, in, in uh, uh, 2023, we've all got apps on our phone, and what we've got pictured here is is uh, one, one of my uh, preferred uh, uh, tide apps called uh, tides and it'll go to the nearest station based on your location or you can choose choose where you want to uh, program it in. Um, tidal currents is the water's going up and down. If there's a restriction, then the water needs to flow in and out. Uh, why is that important to us? Paddling against it or with it. All right. So so here's a Here's probably about a one knot tidal current. If we're going two knots and we're going against it, how fast are we going? Not one. One knot. And so we, we want to factor that into our trip planning. Uh, here's about a four or five knot current. If we're paddling at three knots against it, how fast are we going? <laughs> backwards. Backwards. We're losing backwards. We're, we're, we're losing speed uh, two, two knots probably backwards. We're getting getting pretty exhausted and pretty frustrated and, and certainly not making any uh, headway against a tidal current like that in a, in a kayak. So mm. let's talk about a little risk of collision. Um, uh, again, all this is part of the uh, American Canoe Association level one, two, and three uh, navigation curriculum. Uh, the big and ugly rule first and foremost, um, as kayakers, we are doing everything it takes to stay out of the way of the other vessels. Um, you might've heard of the concept of constant bearing, decreasing range, um, also known as the mariner's eye or the, the seaman's eye. Uh, and that's if you see a bow, a boat on your bow coming at you, uh, and five minutes later, it's still coming at you, still on your bow, but it's closer. Uh, the bearing is constant, but the range decreasing. Uh, now it's 10 yards ahead of you, still on your bow. You probably have a, a pretty strong risk of collision. Or if you're keeping a straight course in your kayak and you look over your shoulder and a jet ski, a, a watercraft's coming up you, uh, dead astern, and you look back a few minutes later and he's still dead astern, um, uh, but he's a little closer. Again, constant bearing, decreasing range. If you don't do anything or the personal watercraft operator doesn't do anything, um, uh, going to be a risk of collision. That also works if you look off your, 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 your port bow or your starboard bow or your, your port side or your starboard side. Uh, and here's a cute little, uh, little graphic to ex explain that. So the, the bearing's constant, the range is decreasing. So uh, what do you guys think about crossing shipping channels? Has anyone ever done it? Yeah, we do it here. We have a shipping in the Cape Fear River. 
Okay. Yeah, those, those big ships are going faster than it looks like. Okay. Uh, one of the bullet points there, that's for darn sure. Um, I've, I've had, I've had Harbor masters and other Marine law enforcement people tell me you can't have a kayak in a shipping channel. Um, that's, that's absolutely not true. However, if we're paddling defensively, we want to, um, uh, we, we want to take some precautions and not get squished or not get the danger signal. And, uh, we, as we're learning to look at the charts, we can see where the shipping channels are. A big ship like that container ship pictured wouldn't be outside of the channel. It would get get stuck in the mud. It would go aground if it did. So we've got a pretty good idea of where they're going to be. If we're going to cross that channel, uh, we, we group up outside the channel, at the edge of the channel. Uh, just like crossing the street, we look both ways. Those larger ships are moving way faster than you think. So if there's any doubt uh, at all, you let the, the large vessel go by before you cross. Um, uh, fish stay in a school to, to uh, escape predators. So we'll, we'll stay together as a pod of kayakers. We'll present a big visual uh, target. We'll try not to string out and go single file. So the faster paddlers are are paddling a little slower and the slower paddlers are giving it all they got. So we're, we're moving a, across in a, in a cohesive pod. Uh, and I, I tell my students uh, on the commercial harbors where I've, I've uh, take paddlers, even if you get the danger signal, uh, fire more short blasts on the ship's horn, you hang your head in shame uh, because we don't want to, we don't want to even make those uh, pilot of the big ship even worried that you're going to hit, um, uh, you'll you'll stay outside the channel, be obvious about what you're doing, and let them pass before you cross. Uh, we might talk about a little bit about VHF FM marine radios in a in a harbor environment with the kayak, uh, but we'll stay tuned for a future future episode. Uh, no no pun intended there. You thought I was done with the bad jokes. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, float plans. And a lot of times I think we we overcomplicate the float plan and, and just about all of us have a, has a, a text app on our cell phone uh, and we've got a, a trusted loved one uh, with the text app on their phone. So so this, this is what a float plan uh, with, a, with an app might look like. Okay, so uh, if if you're worried that they're not going to report you overdue, um, uh, probably the wrong person to send the the the, the message to. So uh, just a simple uh, app, and I again would encourage the use of a photograph, whether it's a, a a few kayaks at the launch ramp before you shove off, or in a in a, a powerboat situation a picture of the boat in the water before you shove off uh, because the Coast Guard uh, search and rescue folks um, uh, like to have a good visual of, of, what, they're, of what they're looking for. Um, I also talk about being very specific in your instructions that you're um, uh, calling the Coast Guard. Here's the phone number to the nearest Coast Guard station. Don't make your your trusted loved one, figure that out uh, and, and give them the phone number to the command center, uh, make it easy for them. So, all right, uh, some suggested next steps on water navigation class is a, is a great thing to do. Um, look, Sandra, Sandra uh, has got, uh, I often take a selfie of the paddlers at the put-in, who, who who's there and 
what they're wearing. Great, great, uh, great tip there. Oops, I'm popping ahead here. Um, check out some uh, boating apps for your phone. Naviotics boating uh, is one I just particularly have been using for, for a number of years, and, and it works well for me in a variety of different settings. Tides and tidal current apps, uh, and be on the lookout for some uh, additional Oxpad programming. So, uh, uh, first of all, before we uh, get into any feedback, anybody okay. have any questions or or observations? There's a question in the chat box from Gene Trapani. Trapani, what compass do you use on the deck of your sea kayak? Well, that's a great question. I'm going to switch gears here and um find a picture of it and it used to be made by silva uh, 70p compass i think it's called uh and so there's a there's a picture of the silva 70p uh and it's made um specifically to fit in a lot of um a lot of uh, touring kayaks plastic and, and composite you'll see a dimple in fact one of my students asked me yesterday what that what that uh, half round hole was um, uh, for, and it's sp specifically designed to fit that Silva 70P compass. Uh, I also um, showed that picture of the deck mounted compass, the yellow compass, uh, and I forget the manufacturer of that, but but that's a, that's a nice backup to the Silva 70P. All right, uh, great question. Who else? And thanks, Joey, for the the text there. Any other questions? Type in the Nav app for the iPhone. Joey, if you could uh, uh, simply type Navionics Boating. You should be able to find that. Mm -hmm. One thing you didn't mention was natural navigation with regards to, you know, you take a a heading and rather than staring at your compass or staring at your Garmin, if you can see land, if you're not, if it's calm enough that you can see land, is just find find that point on land and paddle to that. And paddle to that and maybe set up a range in front of the, in front of the lighthouse that's back on the beach a little bit. Uh, and so you're paddling with those two points that are in line with each other. And if they start to fall out of line, you can see that you're drifting um, uh, in one direction or the other based on the wind or the tidal current or both. Uh, and you, you can adjust accordingly. But yeah, that's a, that's a great strategy, orienting yourself uh, uh, on the beach with the chart uh, and the and the can bear and compass, figuring out okay, there's there's the lighthouse we want to go to for lunch. Uh, let let's let's uh, uh, put a course in for it, but just just know where it is by orienting on the on the beach. And relating to that, uh, after you <clears throat> go after you launch for a few minutes, turn around. And look at where you started, so you know on the way back, you know what it's supposed to look like to get to the place you need to return to. Exactly, uh, a, a point I had hoped to make because very often we'll launch and and folks aren't uh, uh, taking their 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 star point surroundings and and looking at where they are um, uh, so that they know where they're going back to. Very good point. I. Uh, I was kind of spoiled in the days, in my early days of navigation in the Cape Cod Bay, because there's a huge power plant at the east end of the Cape Cod Canal in Sandwich, and, and you could see it from, you know, uh, 20, 20 miles out in the bay. Uh, you, you know how to get that 41-footer home. But yeah, very, very good point is uh, take into account where you're starting from so you can get back to it. Um, Lori asked the question, um, uh, inexpensive place to water resistant charts on the internet. A couple of strategies. Um, you can um, 
I think National Geographic used to sell waterproof eight and a half by uh, uh, 11 printer paper that you put it through a standard uh, uh, inkjet printer and it bound the ink to the paper. And just like that, you had a waterproof uh, chartlet. Um, uh, conversely, you can do a web search of waterproof charts. There's a bunch, bunch on the market, um, on the internet. And then finally, if you go to the NOAA chart homepage, you can uh, custom uh, print a chart and, and for the area that you'll be paddling in, uh, mark it up in advance with some obvious courses with distances and, and uh, uh, courses to steer. Uh, and, and again, either print that on a, um, uh, a waterproof paper um, or, or take it to the copy center and, and have them uh, laminated. So lots of good ideas there. Thank you. All right. Anything well, else? Scott, there's a question about uh, uh, someone's been not have been told not to publish their float plan. So what's your advice to rather to keep it personal or private or um... so so ideally um, yesterday on the trip on the Folly River, um, I, I sent my wife a text saying we're we're getting ready to launch at the Folly River boat landing. We're going to head down to Bird Key. Um, there are uh, uh, six of us. Here's a photograph of the boats lined up on the beach. So the uh, the potential rescuer could see that they're not they're not uh, recreational kayaks. They're not sitting on top of kayaks, but they're 15, 16 foot um, um, touring kayaks. And 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 if we don't connect by 3 p.m., then call Coast Guard Sector Charleston. And I gave her the phone number to the command center, so she doesn't have to worry about it. Like ah. She'll, they'll probably, if you don't hear from me by 3 p.m., call the command center, the Coast Guard uh, command center at this number so she doesn't have to figure out who to call and how to get the phone number. So, so that's, that's one strategy. Um, another strategy is uh, do that printout on a piece of paper with all that good data we just talked about. Um, what, what they're wearing, if there's safety equipment, VHF radio, that sort of thing. Uh, you can leave that on a car windshield, but now you've given, we're, we're unfortunately in a day of age, somebody can take that off the car windshield at the parking lot and know that they're gonna have plenty of time to steal our catalytic converter or steal our, our vehicle or um, uh, meet us at the other end in their boat um, with with uh, with nefarious intent. Um, so the the best strategy, without a doubt, is is get it to uh, a loved one, multiple loved ones. But the 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 problem with multiple trusted loved ones is often if I send it to my wife uh, and my best friend and and my. Um, um, uh, 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 my, my co-instructor's wife, they're all going to assume that the other one's taking care of it. So uh, pretty perspective, uh, prescriptive of, of who to call and, and what time to call. Um, so uh, publishing on a social media where everyone can see, again, uh, Coast Guard uh, command centers um, say time and time again, we, we don't know what, we're, we're not monitoring social media. We, we take a phone call, we take a, a VHF radio call. Uh, we may or may not be sending uh, social media. And if you put it out on social media, um, somebody the next day when you don't come to work is going to say, oh, I saw a Facebook post. Uh, they, they did a kayak trip out to the island. Uh, now I'm getting worried about them, but now that's 12 hours later um, as, as opposed to that that loved one. So I've, I've waxed poetic about that a little bit. Any other any other questions? Yeah, does anybody know, I know the Coast Guard app had a float plan thing. Does anybody know if they're working on coming up with a new version of that that allows people to give the Coast Guard float plans? 
Well, when you say give the Coast Guard uh, flow plans, the Coast Guard doesn't have the capacity to take a flow plan from a kayaker or a boater. There is a um, uh, the old Coast Guard hat, which is is not functional currently, has had functionality to send an email to a loved one with your flow plan in it. Some of the other uh, boating safety or the boating navigation apps, uh, uh, No Wake and uh, um, uh, iBoating, there's a few others uh, on the App Store also have that functionality. But again, you're simply sending a form, uh, either text or email to a to a loved one. Uh, as far as the Coast Guard Boating Safety app, um, that that's uh, that's not going to be resolved in the next month or two. Uh, but but it, we are recommending that it not be used. It's no longer available on the uh, Apple Store. It is available on Android. A lot of the links are broken. Uh, mm -hmm. And because of the way that the Coast Guard came into that app, um, uh, we don't we don't have uh, ready uh, ready access to to make it right. So that's being talked about at, at senior levels in the in the Coast Guard Auxiliary and the Coast Guard Boating Safety Program at Coast Guard headquarters. Uh, the way forward is not clear yet, but we are recommending that that those apps not be used or, or not be recommended, the Coast Guard Boating Safety app. Scott, I'm sorry, can I interrupt? Um, sure. Didn't they uh, fix that app last year? Because I can pull it up fine. They they, they did not, um, I, I've spent probably um, all told 12 hours talking about it with senior leadership at Coast Guard headquarters. They're bringing the uh, various components, uh, different stakeholders within the Coast Guard organization um, in, and uh, it, 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 it's, it's not, not available in the App Store. It's not completely functional if you already have it on your iPhone, and it's not completely functional um, on the Android devices. Uh, and, and again, the, 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 the clear senior leadership party line is 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 we're we're working on a way forward um uh but but uh, the the apps aren't functional right fully functional right now and we recommend they not be used okay thank you yeah yeah you're you're quite welcome um you're quite welcome i'm just thinking later in this week the uh national voting safety advisory committee um uh will be getting a brief from from uh, uh, Coast Guard headquarters on the status of the app, and and they'll be saying the the same same thing that I'm I'm saying there. So, um, if you can give them any suggestions for it, uh, I believe that it you should have the ability to link because we don't paddle alone mostly. We all paddle with groups. So, if there was some way where we could each file a float plan with it and link them together somehow to state, hey, we're all in a paddling group together out on the water. Right, and, and there are some commercial, um, there are some commercial apps uh, called No Wake is one of them. And, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't recall the other one that allow that functionality, but it's, um, it, it's, uh, it's a big deal. Uh, putting an app together like that, the Coast Guard's not often the the best route to 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 own something like that. And and again, we're 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 realizing there's some very valid uses for it, but uh, I haven't quite determined a way forward. Okay, thank you. Sure thing, and and thanks. I couldn't be more uh, a little more prescriptive. All right, I um uh, I I want to I want to conclude by saying. That if you do nothing else, uh, copy my uh, copy my uh, phone number and email down. If there's anything I can do to uh, help you out with your Oxpad mission or your um, recreational boating safety mission, uh, you should see it there on the screen. And um, uh, and if I could have any feedback, did did we meet the objectives tonight? Uh, were the objectives appropriate? Uh, that sort of thing. And, and again, at this point, uh, 
out of respect for your time, feel free to sign off if you if you don't want to stick around. Thanks so much, Scott. It was uh, very nice. Take care.